Okay, this video is going to go through some worked answers to a Kahoot quiz that is about alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, and aromatic compounds. So if you haven't tried this Kahoot quiz, go down to the link below this video and you can follow through and have a go at the quiz. Or if you're an instructor or a lecturer and teach chemistry and you'd like to use this quiz, just follow that link and you can use it in your own classes. So the first question in this quiz is about identifying uh, hybridization states. So that we know that carbon to satisfy its octet would like to make four bonds. If it makes four single bonds, it's going to be sp3 hybridized. If it makes one double bond and two single bonds, it's going to be sp2 hybridized. And if it makes two pi bonds and one and two single bonds or sigma bonds, then it's going to be sp hybridized. So think of it as we, we take out two s orbitals and then our three 2p orbitals and the carbon atom can have a sort of a choice about which of these it uses in bonding to the other atoms around itself. If it has four atoms that it has that it wants to bind to or form bonds with then it's going to need to use all four of those atomic orbitals to form those bonds and so if we have four bonding partners we're going to have sp3 hybridized and you can see if we have one s orbital and three p orbitals overall there's four atomic orbitals going in to make the hybrid uh, molecular or the hybridized orbitals and so therefore we're going to have four hybrid orbitals to uh, to get into bonding with each one of the other atoms if we only take three of those so one two s orbital and two two p orbitals then we're going to end up with sp2 hybridized Overall, there'll be three hybridized orbitals and we'll be able to make bonds to three atoms and we'll have a p orbital left over. So there'll be a p orbital left over to make pi bonds with, an, with one of those other atoms. I'll do a different color for this. If we just have two uh, of the atomic orbitals hybridized, we'll take the 2s and one of the 2p and we'll end up with sp hybridized. And there'll be two sp hybridized orbitals so we can make bonds to two other atoms and we'll have two times two p orbitals left over that are orthogonal to each other and can each engage in pi bonds with another atom okay so really this all boils down to the fact that we can spot hybridization in neutral molecules that have all of the octet, the octet rule for all of the elements uh, met we can spot what hybridization the atoms are by just counting up the number of atoms that are bonded to that carbon. So if we look at C1 in this case, we've got a carbon atom here that is singly bonded to one carbon atom, singly bonded to another uh, atom, an oxygen, and then doubly bonded to this oxygen. So there's only three bonding partners for this carbon atom. And so we must have used sp2 hybridized orbitals on that carbon to form those three bonds. On the other hand, this carbon here, we have just one carbon atom here and one carbon atom here uh, bonded to that carbon. There's no other elements bonded to that carbon. So there's only two uh, bonding partners. And so to get two hybridized orbitals, we're going to have a situation where we have S P hybridized carbon atom and the question doesn't ask you about this but the C3 position is also SP hybridized because it's also part of a triple bond and just has two other atoms that it's bonded to and then finally the C4 position at the end of the chain here okay it looks like it's only making one bond we only draw a line going from this terminus to one atom However, we know that to satisfy the octet rule for that carbon atom, we must have three other bonds. And when we see a line terminate like that, there's an implied number of hydrogens that then adds up to satisfy the octet rule for that carbon. So that means that that carbon atom has one, I'll draw these in in red, one, two, three hydrogens. So overall, it's making four bonds. And to get to four bonds, we must have sp3 hybridized. It's got three bonds to hydrogens and one to a carbon atom over here. 
Okay, so we've got SP2, SP, and SP3. And that is this answer here, the green square. Okay, question two asks us about how these two molecules are related to each other. So the first thing we need to know to do is to work out the molecular formulas. Because for the molecules to be isomers, they must have the same molecular formula. So let's count up the carbons first. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's C5. And then uh, let's leave the hydrogens uh, to last because we can easily count up the oxygens. There's just one oxygen atom. And so let's count up the hydrogens. And this is normally the, the place where uh, many students will, will struggle. So we've got one hydrogen here. So let's keep tally one. And then each of the carbon atoms that we've drawn in this line bond structure, each of those must make four bonds to satisfy the octet rule. And so at carbon atom one, we've drawn three bonds, one to an oxygen uh, up here, one to a carbon atom down here, and one to a carbon atom here. So three bonds, there must be one implied hydrogen. So there it is there. So let's add to our tally, that's two hydrogens. And then at the other carbons around this ring, we've got two bonds to carbon atoms. So we've got one bond here and one bond here. So there must be two implicit hydrogens to make up the other two bonds that carbon needs to make to satisfy the octet rule. And so there's one, two of those other hydrogen atoms. So add to our tally, so up to four. There's two here as well. So one, two, two here, one, two, and then two here, and then the last one. So one, two. So overall, I've got 10 hydrogen atoms. So the molecular formula for that compound is C5H10O. Now let's look at the next compound. We've got carbons. We've got one, two, three, four, five. So that's C5 once again. We've got one oxygen, so let's put that in. And then we've got some number of hydrogens. Now this carbon atom here is making four bonds already. It's got two bonds to this oxygen atom, and then it's got bonds to carbons on either side. So it's got its four bonds, satisfies the octet rule, so no hydrogens attached to that position. Look at carbon two here, we've got two hydrogens attached because we've got two bonds to carbons either side. So to make up the four bonds, we need two hydrogens. At the end of the chain here, we should have three hydrogens. And then we've got some symmetry here, so we should be able to quickly draw in the other hydrogens at carbon atoms four and five. So let's count these up. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So H10, let's draw that in red. So we've got C5H10O in both cases. So these molecules are isomers of each other. So we can immediately cross off that qu uh, first question. Now for them to be conformational isomers, the only difference uh, between them has to be rotation around single bonds. So it must have a different orientation of the molecule in space where we get from one form to another by just rotating around single bonds. And we certainly can't do that between these two molecules. Um, so I won't confuse things by using that type of arrow, but uh, these two molecules are not related by rotating around single bonds, so it can't be that one. And we'll give away the game by skipping down to the last one and ruling that out. So to be stereoisomers, we must have the same uh, bonding arrangement of atoms in the molecule. So we must have the same atoms bonded to each other using the same bond orders. Or, you know, we must have a double bond in the same place in each molecule. We must have rings in the same place and so on. These are obviously not stereoisomers because we've got one molecule has a ring system. The other one is uh, a unbranched chain. And uh, one molecule has a double bond to oxygen, whereas the other one has no double bonds at all. So the bonding arrangement is different. And to be a stereoisomer, we must have the same bonding arrangement, but a different three-dimensional arrangement of the atoms. So I can't be this one either. So it must be that these compounds are constitutional isomers. Let's just double check that. Constitutional isomers are where we have the same molecular formula, but a different bonding arrangement of the atoms within the molecule. And that's true. We've got one molecule is cyclic, the other one is acyclic. One molecule has no double bonds, the other one has a double bond. So this is the correct answer. The 
yellow circle. Okay, question three. We've got a cyclic molecule here and we're asked what type of stereoisomer is this? So on a ring system, when we have uh, two substituents like this, they can be on either the same side or opposite sides. Now, we're not talking about ortho, meta or para because that only applies to benzene rings. So we must have a benzene ring, which is a six membered ring with alternating single and double bonds. Or if we look at it more carefully than it has aromaticity, and we can talk about that in more detail in a different video. But also metapara only applies to benzene rings, not to molecules like this, which has a fully saturated six membered ring. We would call that a cyclohexane. as a different kettle of fish. Uh, it can't be a Z or an E isomer because we only use those terms to talk about double bonds. So a Z isomer would have the highest priority substituents on the same side of a double bond. We don't use that terminology normally for uh, cyclic molecules like this. So it's cis versus trans. We can use those terms for cyclic molecules like this. Trans means opposite sides. And so this molecule is not the trans. Cis means same. And just remember, cis says that sound, c same, cis. And so this is the cis isomer. So the correct answer is the yellow circle for this uh, question. Moving on to question four, we've got a alkene now, and we're asked what best describes the geometry of this alkene. So let's try to rule out a couple of possibilities here. When we have an alkene and we're looking at whether it is a cis versus a trans, it must be unambiguous what we're referring to be on the same or opposite sides. So we can either use cis and trans where we have di substituted compounds like this or like that. So really we're talking about uh, the methyl groups on the same side or are the hydrogens on the same side. So at either end of this alkene, we've got um, these two substituents that are uh, either on the same side or the opposite side to these two substituents in an unambiguous way. And really it's about whether we have non-hydrogen hydrogen substituents. So in this case, we've got a di-substituted double bond. We call it di-substituted because there's two non-hydrogen substituents. So cis to trans is only applicable to these di-substituted uh, alkenes. So it must be either E or Z. Now there's a trick in this question. is The alkene is drawn in an unusual way. Uh, more often in textbooks, lecture notes, and online, you'll see uh, double bonds drawn like this, or maybe like that. And I've deliberately drawn the alkene vertically to expose a common misconception when assigning E or Z to an alkene geometry. And the common misconception is that we have to be really careful when we split the molecule into halves, how we split the molecule. We have to split the molecule so that we look at one side and then the other, where we're looking at one carbon atom of the alkene versus the other carbon atom of the alkene. So we're not looking left and right because we could be drawing the molecule vertically and then we're looking at uh, top versus bottom. And that's the case in this molecule here. So if I use a different color, we're going to split the molecule so that we look at one carbon atom of the alkene, so that's here, versus the other carbon atom of the alkene after we've signed a priority at each of those carbon atoms in turn. So we're only going to look at the top half first. So that top half of the molecule there, we're looking at the substituents attached to this carbon atom here, and we're assigning them to higher versus lower priority. So we know that chlorine has a higher atomic number than carbon, and so the higher priority, and we'll just use ones and twos, one will be chlorine and two will be carbon. Okay. Now I'm going to use a different color now to this carbon atom here. We then look at that carbon at the other end of the alkene and we say, well, what is the order of priority of those two substituents? We've got a bromine versus a hydrogen. Bromine is a higher atomic number than hydrogen. And so that must be the higher priority. And the hydrogen is the lower priority. 
Now that we've assigned priority to each end of the alkene, then we look uh, across the double bond from a different vantage point. So now we're going to look at the double bond where we look at it like this, where the axis goes from one carbon to the other carbon of the double bond. And we look, is the highest priority substituent on one end at the same side of that axis uh, as the highest priority at the other end? And they are. So the carbon, uh, sorry, the chlorine and the bromine are the highest priority substituents and they're on the same side, same as that z sound. And so I want you to think of a z and a s and a cis, same. And so this is the Z uh, compound. So that is the correct answer, the uh, blue triangle. And the E is incorrect. So just remember how to split the molecule. We split it so that when we assign priority, we're comparing the two substituents attached to one carbon atom of the alkene versus the two substituents attached to the other carbon of the alkene. A very common misconception about doing this is if I draw the molecule that way, some students will look at that and say, well, I've got a chlorine here and a bromine there and a methyl group there and a hydrogen there, and then they're going to split the molecule this way. But that is not correct because we can't compare the substituents across the two different carbon atoms. We have to look at one carbon atom and then the other. And so we would get the wrong result when we're assigning priority uh, that way. So uh, don't do it that way. Okay, question five is a nomenclature problem. We need to um, name this compound. And let's just do this uh, quickly. We'll start numbering the longest chain. So if we start numbering here, one, two, three, four, five. Now a common mistake will be we've drawn the molecules if we're going to put six out here, but that's not the longest chain. So we're going to scrub that out because we can go up this part here and get to a seven carbon chain rather than a six carbon chain. And considering that only one of the answers is a heptane, we merely know what the answer is, but we'll go through the whole naming conventions for this anyway. So then we need to make sure that our numbering is started at the end, that we get to our substituents as fast as possible. So we get to a methyl substituent at the two position versus at the five position. If we had a number the other way, so we'll use blue one, two, three, we would have got to substituents at the three position rather than the two position. So we're not going to number that way. And I'll just erase those. So we've got uh, one methyl group at the two position. So it's going to be a two comma. And then we've got two methyl groups at the five positions. So it's going to be five comma five. And they're all methyl groups. So we've got a trimethyl system. And it's a seven carbon chain. So the parent for a seven carbon alkane is heptane. And so this would be a trimethyl heptane. And so the answer is this uh, green square down the bottom here. Now each of the other answers have made a common mistake. So the first answer, we've named it as a hexane. So we've gone down one of these uh, chains, uh, including the methyl group rather than the ethyl group. And so we haven't got the longest chain in our uh, overall parent name. And one of these is numbering from one end and one of them is numbering from the other end. The other one here is a fairly common mistake in that we haven't started numbering at the very end of the chain for this one here in yellow. So I'll use uh, red here. We've actually started numbering here and gone out this way. We've correctly gone out here to make it a, um, a six carbon chain in this particular case, but we've got these two methyl groups here and here as substituents on a six carbon chain rather than having a seven carbon chain that has one methyl substituent on it. So just keep that um, in mind. So each one of those is incorrect. Okay, looking at question six, we've got now some reactions. Question six asks, what is the major product of the following reaction? We've got an alkene and we're adding hydrogen bromide, HBr to this. And we're going to get with an alkene, we're going to get electrophilic addition. So that's the most common reaction of alkenes. The electrophile in this case is the hydrogen bromide. 
And we're going to get addition because both elements of that molecule are going to be added across the bond to make a new molecule. So we, if we look at these, we can immediately rule out B. So the mistake in B is that we started here with a 1, 2, or well, I'll number the starting material, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 carbon chain with a methyl group at the 5 position, sorry, at the 4 position. If we look at B, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we've got a fifth methyl group, but we've lost another carbon atom. So we uh, don't do that in electrophilic addition, so that immediately is wrong. For C, we have added the bromine atom at the 3 position. And in electrophilic addition, the two elements of the diatomic molecule that we're adding, in this case HBr, get added to either end of the double bond. So uh, we wouldn't expect the bromine to end up at the 3 position because the 3 position does not have um, a double bond to another carbon atom. So really the choice is between A and D. So we could add the hydrogen to this end of the double bond and the bromine to this end, or we could add the hydrogen to this end, and it's not drawn because we normally draw the uh, molecules with implicit hydrogens, and then the bromine at this end. And there's a particular rule known as Markovnikov's rule. So Markovnikov's rule, a bit of a mouthful, but his rule lets us decide between these two possibilities. So, and the rule states that the hydrogen will add to the less hindered end of the double bond. Or less substituted is more accurate. So we'll say the less substituted uh, end of the alkene. So if we look at this molecule, when we talk about substitution of an alkene, we're talking about how many non-hydrogen substituents are attached to the carbon. So this end of the alkene has two implicit hydrogens, and we would call this a unsubstituted alkene. We don't care that it's doubly bonded to a carbon at the other end, because to be an alkene, it has to have that. We're only looking at its other two substituents. They're both hydrogens, and so we call this an unsubstituted alkene. Whereas carbon atom 4 here, we have a carbon-based substituent here and a carbon-based substituent here attached to that carbon atom. So there's two non-hydrogen substituents, and so we would call that a di-substituted alkene, or a uh, di-substituted carbon within that alkene. Uh, sorry, so that nomenclature should be slightly different. We should call that an unsubstituted carbon atom of the alkene. Slightly different to talk about the substitution of the overall alkene. So that's a disubstituted carbon. Okay, so the hydrogen will add to this position um, over here. So we're going to end up with a hydrogen here, and therefore the other element, the bromine, must add to this end over here. And so there it is, there at that um, 4 position. There's our numbers. Okay, so if A is the correct answer and D is the anti-Markovnikov product. It will probably be, probably be formed in some amount, but it will not be the major product of the reaction. So the answer to this question is the red triangle, A. Looking at question 7, we're asked, what is the major product of the following reaction? We're adding bromine across this double bond. So like question 6, it's an electrophilic addition, but now it's not hydrogen bromide, it's Br2. So we're going to add bromine and bromine to either end of the double bond. So we can immediately rule out C and D. D is a substitution reaction. We've got implicit hydrogens here, and we've substituted those for these bromines while keeping the alkene intact. And that is not an addition reaction, it's a substitution. So that doesn't happen. And the addition of bromine occurs such that we add the bromine to either end of the alkene. This is adding the bromine to just one end of the alkene, so that's not correct either. So then we've got a choice between cis 
and trans. So we've got different stereoisomers, and to be more precise, these are diastereomers, different three-dimensional arrangement where they're not mirror images, and they're not conformers of each other. So how do we decide? Well, we know the mechanism for this sort of reaction goes via an intermediate where the bromine forms a three-membered ring like this, uh, that we call a bromonium ion, and then the bromide anion, which we're now lone pairs, attacks that opposite to the bond that breaks. So for that to happen, the bromine, if I've drawn the bromonium ion with the bromine going down, the bromine Br minus bromide anion must come from the top face, and so the bond will be to the top face of that molecule. So we'll end up with something that looks like this, where the bromine uh, that was originally added was on one face, and the second one that came in is on the other face. So we've got opposite, so that's the trans. Okay, and that corresponds to B. So B is the correct answer to this question. Now, to be really uh, precise about this, we would say that we also get the enantima. So we might say ent for enantima, because we could start with the bromonium ion being like this, which is actually just exactly the same thing flipped, but we can imagine it otherwise as being the bromide anion attacks from the other end, and we would end up with the opposite enantima of the product. So don't worry about that too much at this stage, but just be aware that when we get uh, achiral molecules reacting with achiral reagents, we're going to end up, end up with equal amounts of enantiomers when we form a chiral molecule. Question eight, we're looking at the stability of carbocations. And this relates a little bit to question six, where we looked at Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule is the result of carbocation stability. And carbocation stability can be estimated through a rule where we say that the more substituted the carbon bearing the positive charge, the more stable that carbocation. So the order of stability is going to be that tertiary carbocations are more stable then secondary carbocations are more stable than primary, and they're more stable than methyl carbocations. So how do we know whether a carbocation is tertiary, secondary, primary, or methyl? We look at the carbon with the positive charge. So here it is here, here it is here, here it is here, and here it is here. And we look at the number of non-hydrogen substituents. Now, a little wrinkle about uh, carbocations is that we do not have uh, a full octet of electrons around a carbocation carbon. We've got a carbon with just one, two, three substituents and a vacant p orbital. Each of those substituents is singly bonded, so we've got a pair of electrons in each one of those bonds. So we actually only have six valence electrons uh, around a carbon that is part of a carbocation. And so when we look at A, we've got, let's do this in blue, we've got one, two, three non-hydrogen substituents or alkyl groups. So that three non-hydrogen substituents means that it's a tertiary carbocation. For B, for that carbon to have uh, three partners in a vacant p orbital, it has uh, one carbon substituent, a second carbon substituent. Don't worry about what else is bonded to that carbon. We're only worried about the first atom we bump into. And then it must have an implied hydrogen there. So that's its one hydrogen and two non-hydrogen substituents. So we have two non-hydrogen, so that's a secondary carbocation. This one is just the same sort of thing. It doesn't matter what is happening up here. We've got a carbon. Don't worry about what it's bonded to. We've got a carbon. And then to satisfy that three bonding partners it must have, we've got a bond to a hydrogen that is implicit. And so therefore, this is also a secondary carbocation. Finally, this one here. Now, it's really a common mistake that's really commonly made is that students will mistake this for a tertiary carbocation. This carbon atom that has the positive charge only has one 
carbon-based substituent or one non-hydrogen substituent. It doesn't matter what else that carbon is bonded to. These things out here do not matter in terms of assessing the stability of the carbocation carbon. So therefore, that carbocation carbon must have two hydrogens that are implicit as drawn. So it's got two hydrogens and one non-hydrogen substituent. So therefore, it's a primary carbocation and extremely unstable. So by far the most stable out of these is A, which is this first one here, the red triangle. That's the correct answer. Question nine. What will be the major product of this reaction? So now we're looking at electrophilic aromatic substitution. So EAS, we could abbreviate that, electrophilic. So we're still talking about reagents that are electrophilic, similar to addition to double bonds, but now we're doing them on aromatic molecules. And aromatic molecules have a certain stability that is associated with having that aromatic pi system. So electrophilic aromatic substitution because of that stability of the aromatic pi system, instead of doing addition reactions, they will do substitution. So we'll get one of these hydrogens that is attached to the aromatic ring, and we'll substitute it for another group. So here we've, in uh, compound A, we've substituted a sulfonic acid for that hydrogen. In B, we've substituted a chlorine atom for that hydrogen. In C, we've substituted a nitro group for that hydrogen atom. D, we can immediately rule out because in that molecule, we've actually, I've sneakily drawn in one hydrogen, but, um, and which we wouldn't normally do, but I'm trying to trick you here. There's a, another hydrogen that's implicit in this structure. If it's neutral, we must have a fourth bond for that carbon atom. And so it must be a hydrogen atom. And for a fourth bond of this carbon, we must have a hydrogen atom as well. So overall, this is an addition reaction product and they don't normally occur with aromatic molecules because you lose the aromaticity by breaking up that pi system. So then we go to choice between A, B and C. A, a sulfonic acid, we would do that reaction with fuming sulfuric acid. So that product would occur from treating benzene with fuming sulfuric acid. Uh, but we've got nitric acid in the mixture here as well, so that can't be the product. Put a chlorine in, we would normally use chlorine, and then because the molecule's aromatic, we need some extra oomph. We need a catalyst to make the reaction go. And the most common catalysts are iron, three catalysts like iron trichloride. So it's not that one. They're not the conditions. It's C, the classic conditions for nitration of an aromatic molecule are nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And under those conditions, we get a really highly reactive electrophilic species that will react with the benzene ring to make an intermediate. And then that intermediate loses a proton to regain aromaticity and to give us our nitrated product. So the answer to this one is the yellow circle, C. Now for our final question in this set of Kahoot Questions. Question 10, another reaction. What is the major product of the following reaction? We've got benzene reacting with this acid chloride. And we've got iron trichloride as a catalyst. And these are the conditions for a friedel crafts reaction. And there's two types of friedel crafts reactions. There's alkylations we we'll put an alcohol group on. So this is an alkyl group. So that would be a Friedel Crafts alkylation product, but it's not that. We don't have a, a alkyl chloride. We've got an acyl or acid chloride. So this is an example of a Friedel Crafts acylation. And in a Friedel Crafts isolation, we've still got an electrophilic aromatic substitution. So we're substituting this hydrogen for the acyl group. And the acyl group is everything that is attached to that chlorine. So there's our acyl group. Now I've done something a bit tricky here and I've reoriented the molecule relative to how the um, reagent is drawn. 
So we, we don't have A. A, we've got an carbonyl group, but it's not an acyl group, it's an acid chloride. We kept the chlorine, but in the substitution, we actually lose that chlorine and hydrogen as a byproduct, hydrogen chloride. It's not B, we're not doing a chlorination, that would need chlorine, molecular chlorine, Cl2, and a catalyst like iron trichloride. So the answer is D. Here we have the acyl group, and just uh, satisfy yourself that this is the same acyl group as we've drawn in blue over here. We've got a carbon atom here attached to a carbon atom that has a hydrogen attached that's implied with two methyl groups then attached to that. So we've got a carbon atom attached to a carbon here with a hydrogen and then two methyl groups attached. So that's a branch chain alkyl group, so it's still an alkyl group that is part of an acyl group and it matches up with compound D. So the answer to that one is the green square D. Okay, hopefully you found that a useful summary of some of those questions around alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, and aromatic molecules. Thanks for watching.